So before we got on here, uh, this was definitely a meeting you wanted to have. <laughs> we're going to be talking about yes. we're going to be talking <laughs> about science. And specifically, I wanted to talk about science communication because I read this a little bit about you. And let's just jump into it. What let's is going it. on with science communication? What are some of the issues we're having with science communication? I think right now we live in an era where in science is suddenly hotly contested, right? And I think this is due to a multitude of factors, right? One being that science as of late, and I think a lot of this has been perpetuated by the anti-vax movement and mm -hmm. the sort of weaponizing of COVID for political gain, right? Um, and also for traditional media to have fodder to talk about something that's a really hot button topic that garners a lot of views. Um, but also we're in the midst of this social media storm where any kind of misinformation can be spread exponentially far just you know in in a blink of an eye so what we have i think right now is this sort of distrust of science because of very polarized political views on a lot of scientific topics like vaccines especially with the the covid vaccine and then people who may or may not have scientific understanding grandstanding on something like tiktok or instagram and suddenly their their video shared millions of times and as a scientist you look at it and you're like oh my god this information is completely incorrect <laughs> but so many people share it and it's it's the power of just giving everybody a platform and suddenly anyone can become an expert. So this leaves people like me, science communicators, to try to mop that up and one, to try to dispel misinformation and two, to try to bridge these rifts between the public and its scientists. So I want to get into that for sure. There's a lot there, <laughs> but I want to circle a lot. a lot there. I want to circle into what role I love science. Let me put this disclaimer. I love science. I have a terminal degree. I I'm all into it. But I also wonder. Welcome, Ally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wonder what what role do scientists play in perpetuating a, the negative negativity about science? You know, a lot of it, I think, is in the grand scheme of human behavior. If somebody disagrees with you, I think the innate just hard-coded response is to kind of turn your back on that person or to be mm. defensive in some kind of capacity. And in many aspects, I think that scientists who dedicate their lives to studying a specific focus, and if it's not going directly to improving human life, it's going to the greater understanding of history or the future or something to that to that extent, right? It's it's helping to bolster our species. So you you take somebody who has dedicated their life to it, who is likely in a tremendous amount of student debt due to it, and then you have somebody who is untrained hotly contest what you're saying. And I think the very first reaction is for scientists to just turn their back on the public. So I think in that capacity, scientists being combative with the public is perpetuating this. And that's where negative science activism comes in. But I've always told my colleagues, and I'm the first one to check them on it, that if the public doesn't understand your science or they're misinterpreting it, then that is a problem on you. It is our responsibility of stewards of tr truth to ensure that those who may not have the same luxury of having that intimate understanding of the world around them are educated by those that do, right? So rather than turning your back or chiding them or deriding people that don't get it, you bring them into the flock. You know what I mean? The more the merrier, teach them, inspire them. You know, we as scientists, as you know, uh, we never lost that curiosity from childhood, right? So we maintain this sort of awe of the world. And it's unfortunate because a lot of people that drops off the radar for them. So my whole goal and what I try to get my colleagues to do who are in this kind of negative activism space um, is to re-inspire them, get, get people to see the awe that you live every day. You know, the reason you wake up and drink more caffeine than you should <laughs> so that you can conduct <laughs> your studies. Is there like in my field in fitness, we often have a very interesting problem with the messages and the messengers of fitness, sure. health and wellness. And generally in, in science in general, do, is there a problem with maybe the messages that are going out and the people who are providing the messages who are experts? Is that an issue you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that pu public science communication is difficult, right? Because the average American has a sixth grade reading level. And Again, as you know, when you get higher and higher into your education, 
your level of focus becomes so highly specified that you are like the myopic of the myopic. You're in the weeds, right? You're not just studying biology. You're studying human cells that happen to be cancerous and you're studying one particular gene on one chromosome that causes a very specific rare cancer, right? That is what your PhD becomes in. And so you are so far and above the be- the basics that sometimes when you try to communicate what it is you're doing, what you're passionate about, you are overshooting the comprehension level of the public. And I think one that scares them, they're like, I don't, I don't know what any of this means. And it turns them off, right? That's not at that point, science for the public is not sexy anymore. It's not fun and awe-inspiring. It's mostly just confusing and convoluted, right? So I, I do think that a lot of experts in our field have a difficult time with the public interface, right? They don't they don't know how to be relatable or how to make science fun or gripping. It's fun and gripping for them, of course, and us, but not so much for you know people who may have no previous connection to the science. What's also interesting, I think, is like, what is your first experience with science growing up? And if it's, you know, in high school or whatever, middle school, and like it's boring or it's not interesting, you're already off on a bad foot about what science is and isn't, you know? Of course. And and I have a huge point of contestation with the American education system, especially when it comes to STEM fields, because it has become so standardized for testing. It's like, we're just going to test you on the basic principles and then you regurgitate that to take your test and then you just let it leave your mind, right? I think that science is supposed to be immersive and tactile and touch things and explode stuff in beakers and really get into it to understand it and appreciate it conceptually versus just being able to regurgitate it to pass a standardized exam and then move on with your career, right? Um, It's really, really hard to evoke an awe and a respect for it, you know, in that capacity. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a lot of things is how you're introduced to it and how, you know how it's applicable in your life. And it feels like in this past couple of years, science was, you know, everybody's like, science is great. But then once the pandemic came and COVID, I wanted to get back into this because I think it's important we, we talk about this, especially from a scientist, scientific aspect. What was it about the vaccine that became such a hot point and the messengers of the vaccine that became such a kind of polarized aspect with it, you know, obviously the political aspect, but what else was there? I think a lot of it is that the way that the vaccine and its efficacy was communicated, you know, it was sort of a get your vaccine and don't get sick from COVID. But the caveat of vaccines is that they don't prevent you from becoming infected, right? They just help to mitigate really extreme symptoms. And so the general public again said, okay, I'm going to put my faith in this and I'm going to get a vaccine. And and now I basically have a Superman bubble around me. I will not get <laughs> sick from COVID. I am invincible. Like modern science has made me invincible. And then when people got sick or they got COVID, they were confused by the message initially, right? You have to set the expectations of anybody to, to ensure satisfaction, right? With fitness, set your expectations, right? If, mm-hmm. if you think you're going to have a six pack tomorrow and you don't, <laughs> you're going to give up, no. right? No. It's not going to happen. So it's the same thing, I think, with something like public health initiatives. If you don't set expectations properly, people will get frustrated and be dissatisfied and then turn on you. And that's what we saw. Um, we saw a lot of this, you know, where, where people were saying, well, you know, I had family members or a friend of a friend or a coworker that died and they had the vaccine. So the vaccine doesn't work. And you're like, well, it does. But what you're missing are like underlying possible comorbidities or complications that these people had. And then there were these just kind of made up statistics that were float around, floating around about the lack of efficacy of the vaccine. And I think, again, because of social media, a lot of this just kind of got out of control and snowballed, you know, and um, of course, vaccines work when they are widely administered, right? We no longer have smallpox on the face of the earth anymore because of effective vaccine rollout. The only place that smallpox exists are in two laboratories, one in the US and one in Russia to be possibly weaponized, which is scary. But um, effective vaccine rollouts work. And the problem with the COVID vaccine is that the compliance was so low. So of course people were like, well, why are people still getting sick? And now there's mutations and now the virus is even more aggressive and what's going on. And it's like, well, it wasn't rolled out. The expectations weren't set. So then people said, it's not going to work. I'm not going to get injected with something I'm unsure of, which is totally understandable, especially if you don't understand the way that it works. Um, And then it just kind of, it became a flop. You know, it did protect 
a, a bunch of people, the people that got it, certainly, and those who are immu immunocompromised, I think it helped a substantial proportion of them. But insofar as the sort of we were expecting for a mass administration and to not COVID out, I mean, COVID's an endemic now. It will be with us forever because we sort of lost our chance, right, to kind of nip yes. it in the bud before it became integrated. It's interesting. Why is this? Again, let's I know there's a political aspect of it, and maybe that's the largest part, but we have had vaccines before and people have been generally OK with vaccination for entry into schools and military and different things. What was the difference in this? Maybe the expectation between those things. You know, I think that there was possibly a bubbling of this in the last we'll call it decade or so, Okay, because the anti-vax movement albeit small, is incredibly vocal. And the problem is that it also has celebrity endorsement, right? And the problem, again, is that when the public doesn't necessarily understand the underpinnings of like peer-reviewed literature or the way that peer-reviewed literature can be weaponized, um, certain messages they trust from sources that are, say, doctors, right? But one of the primary research studies that was conducted that said that, hey, vaccines cause autism, right? This is really where the underpinning of the anti-vax movement started was like this whole vac vaccines cause autism. The guy that really made the cornerstone paper that started this, his name's Andrew Wakefield, and his study was so poorly conducted and the results of which were so inconclusive. It was like 12 patients and he tried to say, oh, well, this correlation here, like obviously vaccines cause autism. It was so bad and it was found that his results were so manipulated that he not only lost his medical license, but he also is is completely uh, disregarded in the world of academic medicine now. But no one talks about that. But his results linger on despite the fact that it was removed from the journal. He no longer has a medical license, you know, but no one talks about that. They're like, oh, yeah. this doctor found this. Right. Um, and then there's these strange correlations that people make these quantum leaps about. Right. Like the signs of autism can be at earliest detected around age two to three. But around age two to three is when you finalize your course of early vaccinations, right? That first kind of bolus that you get when you're a child. And so in this capacity, it's like correlation does not equal causation, but you can see temporally where people would see this paper and then be like, oh, well, my cousin, their child just got diagnosed with autism and they just finished their vaccines. And you're like, it doesn't, it does that right now. Yeah. There is no to, to make the statement right now. There is no correlation between autism and vaccines. But to go back to your original question, this sort of bubbling of distrust was sort of there in the background. Right. It was a small minority of people. But then you get covid vaccine that comes around and people are like, oh, it changes your DNA and it doesn't Crazy. even work. And yeah. And I'm like, that's <laughs> not even how biology works. <laughs> but I think that that really it, it's always kind of been there and it's almost like there was they were waiting for a catalytic moment to strike yeah. like yeah we're gonna show them like this is actually it like this is their the government's trying to inject microchips in me and you're like for the record i wish we were that technologically advanced but unfortunately, i don't I'm have so. a hard I'm time fixing story. bumpers on cars how are we gonna fix this <laughs> oh my <laughs> gosh i'm like i can't even get my internet to not cut no. out you know what I mean? like my router sucks like i don't know about these microchips yeah I'm talking about. it's strange and, it's uh and the point it's about the, the bubbling up, that is a really great point, because I had heard kind of on a fringe about, uh, you know, anti-vaccination movements well before this. But you're right. It feels like this was like it was the opportunity of a lifetime to take advantage right. of right. a message. But on the other hand, I kept thinking, especially as someone in the fitness field, where is the messaging scientifically about um, better conditioning, better health practices? Uh, for people. I felt like that messaging was just not there. There was nothing related not there. to that. You know, and it's unfortunate because that's also a condition, I think, of the American healthcare system. We have an abysmal preventative mechanism uh, it, it, just in general, right? We have a triage system. We have a, if you get sick, here's a bunch of pharmaceuticals, here's a bunch of surgeries, there are a bunch of things we can do. But I mean, even in medical schools, they don't teach nutrition. They don't have immersive courses on the, the really the crux of human health and prevention. It's all, what do you do to treat when it becomes bad? What's the pathology associated with not managing all that other stuff? And I think 
to a certain extent, maybe it's maybe it's hubris. I, I know that there's probably a little bit of corporate greed associated with that, but maybe there's also hubris in thinking that, well, of course, people know how to take care of their own bodies. You know, like, why wouldn't they, why would they think that not eating vegetables and just bombing liters of Coke all day, every day is not good for you? Like, that's crazy. But really, I think um, there is a, a disconnect between human beings and, and the health of their own bodies, you know, and, and you see it in the chronic conditions that uh, plague us today. Well, I think that was an interesting disconnect is like um, having an anti-vax stance and, you know, kind of the whole my body, my choice type of thing. But yes, then yes. ingesting or not having practices that are in alignment with being having a healthier condition it felt very hypocritical to me uh, with course. that. And so I of just course. feel like there's, it's like that we're just we're we're not actually discussing probably the main symptomology of a lot of things where well, this vaccine I mean, will keep, take care of you. You don't have to do anything, you know, versus yeah. like, Hey, you know, there's some responsibility for yourself as well to, of course, you know, I think that just message was not there. I feel like. Definitely not. And it, and unfortunately it, it continues to not be there. And yeah. we're fighting this unfortunate battle in public health, wherein, you know, there's there's the narrative of these are the things that you need to do to take care of your body. And then there's the reality of a lot of areas, especially socio demographically disadvantaged areas where there are food deserts. Right. So you can't get access to produce or the produce is so expensive that you have no choice but to go down to the corner store and, you know, buy processed food. Um, and so it's this really strange system wherein the the amount of money that goes into the medical system is so expansive and it does put a large strain on us economically, certainly. And yet there's no, it feels like program championing preventative right. care to ensure that we can drive that down by simple switches and diet and lifestyle choices. You know, it's, it's, it's tough. It's really tough. Yeah, it is tough. It's just like, what's the priority here? <laughs> you know, and Exactly. And that's where I'm like, is it corporate greed? I don't know as much as you want to be pessimistic about it. You're still like, well, yeah. a lot of pharmaceutical companies that are managing, you know, like Eli Lilly has a good right. monopoly on insulin. So why right. would they be interested in trying to help people prevent type two diabetes? You know, <laughs> well, it has a, questions. <laughs> these are tough questions because as a, you know, a Chris, Chris Rock once said in his comedy routine, there's no money in a cure. No, there's no money in a cure. And, and I think it's one of the things with um, scientifically with like uh, psychedelics as that's moving forward much more in trials and clinics and stuff is how do you monetize something that you maybe only really need one or two times? Of course. And right. <laughs> and the the kind of diverse applications are fascinating, right? Like PTSD applications, et cetera. And the unfortunate thing is when you look at the comparison of the two, right? You can utilize psychedelics and all of their awesome qualities, or you can put somebody on pharma. But if you read through pharmacologic textbooks, so many of these pharmaceuticals will say mechanism of action unknown. So it's kind of a, we've deployed them because we know that they work, but we don't know how. And then that makes me question, well, why are we comfortable neuromodulating, especially young children, when we don't know how it's working or the downstream effects or long term effects of some of these neuromodulators? And then, you know, uh, at, a, at a certain point, you you're like, I don't know, like, for instance, my partner, he was put on Ritalin incredibly young and it, only after. And again, this could be a temporally related, but I've seen some case studies that suggest that there's a relationship. He developed motor Tourette's. And he mm. still has motor Tourette's into adulthood. And it did not occur until he was put on Ritalin and he was like in junior high. Um, and then he started exhibiting these strange tics and they evolved through the course of his life and he still has them today. Um, and obviously motor Tourette's, it, it manifests and is worse when you're younger and then starts to subside as you get older in many cases. Um, but you have to wonder, are were these neuromodulating pharmaceuticals responsible for this neuromodulating based motor control thing? Um, very weird, very interesting. Very, definitely very interesting. So yeah. in thinking about this in terms of communication, like obviously you're getting out there and you're talking about science and science communication. How much responsibility do you, our colleagues have in doing things like podcasts and to like combat things that are clearly false information? I mean, I think that 
it's one of those things where if we don't do it, who will, you right. know, if we don't do it, there will, there will be a tipping point where it's like there no information exists anywhere that matters anymore, you mm. know? And so a lot of it, you know, again, a lot of our colleagues, bless them. They're so far in the weeds that you yeah. listen to them, try to, to do the public interface and it's difficult. So that's why a lot of mine has been based on what do you as the public, as somebody who has no prior scientific understanding, what do you want to learn about? You know, and you get all kinds of weird questions about, you know, strange medical conditions or very specific ones like, hey, uh, my wife has typo blood and neither of her parents do. Should she be concerned? And I'm like, I love that this guy's trying to start drama at the family dinner table, yeah. um, but happy to explain blood typing. You know, anything that they want to learn, allow just like children, allow their curiosity to drive that want to discover more and want to know more and want to get to the crux of the truth rather than listening to somebody speaking on TikTok about like, well, I'm a mother and this is what <laughs> I found medically works. And you're like, oh boy, like <laughs> where do I start with some of this messaging? Like bless them for wanting to be involved. And I think at the end of the day, people just want to do what's right for them and their family. And I totally understand that. And I will never degrade anybody for that pursuit, right? That's hard coded in every single one of us. But the objective, the objective collective understanding of science and the world, if you were to obliterate our species and then say regenerate us from just a little polywog and we would evolve again, the interesting thing is that the same scientific concepts would evolve. We would understand what the acceleration due to gravity is. We would uh, begin to talk about curvature of space time. We would talk about DNA being the crux of, you know, everything we know and the building of, of proteins. But if you were to take some of the dogmas associated with society and obliterate it and then regenerate humans, I highly doubt that they would come back the same, right? Science is consistent for a reason, right? Because so many people chip away at it for so long and it's meant to evolve. Um, so if you can get people to understand the crux of that and to embrace that, I think that that's a really good place to start to show them why science matters. And that's a good segue into why science matters. But it's interesting, like if scientists I've always had this issue, even as someone who's like, you know, gone through all this education, I saw it really early on, started with my bachelor's degree. I'm like a lot of these folks in these academic Ivy Towers, they have no connection to reality. To zero. zero. And that always bothered me. And I wanted to get my doctorate also to be like, have it, but be a regular person also at the same time, <laughs> <Be relatable. laughs> like relatable. And this is the missing link is like going to conferences and stuff is great. But like, you're just talking to your colleagues and all this jargon and vernacular that honestly yep. doesn't really matter when it you're doesn't. to the entire public. To me, this is the crux of the problem with science is just living in it's hypocritical to talk about people living in their silos when you're living in a silo, an of academic course. silo. You know? Of course. Yeah. And so much. I, I talk about this all the time and I joke about it. You know, you read some of the like methodology sections or discussion sections right. of peer reviewed literature and you're like, it's just pontification. I just want to know what the <laughs> results were. Like, just skip to the results. Like <laughs> you're literally trying to impress your friends at the next university over because you know they're going to read it. But like, I, you know what I mean? A lot of it is just not, it's kind of become, and that that's another thing too, is these days, a lot of peer reviewed literature is not necessarily reliable, right? You have journals that are kind of pay for publication. Right. And so the methodology is no longer as strictly sort of scrutinized um, with some of these like real sketchy offshore journals where you're like, wow, you're asking me to be a part of your second publication. Yeah. <laughs> You've only been around for like a month. Um, but I can pay $900 and get something published and that's great. And I can say I'm a peer reviewed scientist. Um, so that's also a little bit sketchy is sort of the economy associated with producing peer reviewed literature, which used to yes. be the gold standard and is now kind of parts of it becoming like the bronze standard, I would say, you know, <laughs> you're like, ah, oh, you're reading some like dubious misspelled manuscript. You're like, I don't know about this. Well, it's like people's extension span is so tiny. And then you want to read this gigantic research article with all these words that you don't know what they mean. Exactly. You may not exactly. even understand the results or the statistical analysis. You may have no the clue abstract. The, the abstract. You don't even know nothing. Yeah. Why I isn't it written like, for like the appropriate for most of our nation? You know? Yeah. And I think uh, I think again, like just to sort of circle back, I think that's a, a good deal of what happened with the covid vaccine because mm. people r tried to read up on it and they were like, OK, the vaccine has genetic material into it. Right. 
and and so it's it's going to interact with the DNA because it's genetic material. So it's going to somehow, I guess, link up to the DNA and start mutating the DNA, right? This is what they thought. But just a basic description of like, well, actually, it's mRNA, which doesn't go into the nucleus. It just constructs things out in the cytoplasm and then makes protein. Like, I mean, I think just getting back to basics would have really helped with a lot of that rather than it's it's a beautiful thing. It's it's a gift and a curse. I think that the Internet and Google has allowed this unprecedented access to information where yeah. in the past you would have had to have gone to secondary tertiary education in order to have access to this. So I love that people have access to it. But when you don't have an untrained eye, you don't know what you're looking for. Misinterpretation is easy. I mean, I can misinterpret things, right? And like we have graduate educations and sometimes it takes you five read throughs to be like, okay, what is actually happening in this experiment? What did they do to these rats? Because it's so right. convoluted. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy. Like peer reviewed literature is wild. <laughs> it is wild. I remember actually, uh, I was at a pool talking to a friend about the COVID vaccine and they had some kind of weird ideas about it. And I was talking to them about spike protein, DNA, mm -hmm. mitochondria, and, you know, and like, they were like, wow, I didn't know that. And I'm yeah, like, but exactly. in my mind, I was like, most people don't know this. This exactly. is crazy. Like, exactly. this is crazy. And then you realize how little people actually know. This is not a jab against them. It's just like when you have a lot of education, you assume other you assume other people understand what you understand. Yes. And it, it goes like that true. with any field, right? It's like yeah. if my mechanic comes up to me and shows me a part <laughs> and so I'm like, I, you know a lot about it, but yeah. like, that's great. I don't know what, I think yeah. that's a spark plug, but I don't know right. what that is. What's this? Like, <laughs> so it's kind of just being able to be, and, and I love what you said about relatability of scientists is so important, right? Like, I mean, I, I have a full sleeve of nerdy science tattoos, right? I have a yeah, nose like piercing. Tattoos. Oh, yeah. like, you know, and I think it's a brave new world. It's no longer kind of crusty older dudes up on podium you know yeah. there is sort of this ushering in of younger more in touch more i would say even like politically activism conscious scientists i think that are beginning to take over um but there's this kind of like battle now i think between like the traditional like you said mm. ivy league kind of dusty old dudes and then this younger generation trying to make moves um but it's it's hard i mean sometimes i've been a public science communicator for about five, six years now. And I feel like I'm screaming into a void. Yeah. You know, sometimes I'm like, I hope this reaches the right audience, you know? Um, and it's like, you get upset when you're being suppressed for like women shaking their butts in bikinis, which no shade. I'm like, please yeah. do you girl. But do like you, yeah. when, when you're getting millions of views and something that I'm trying to educate to like sustain human life and trying to encourage people to become vaccinated for their own health and wellness and the wellness of their families. And I've got, you know, a thousand views. I'm like, ah, oh, come on. You know, sometimes <laughs> it's frustrating, but you know, you try to work with the algorithm as you can. So this is the crux, I think, of a really important part of this conversation is what is the line? Mm -hmm. I've had a great conversation with a yoga influencer the other day, and it just came out. And we had this, I thought it was a really good conversation about well, you realize that people are looking at this partially because you're in a bikini. Of course. Right. There's a reality to this. She of was course. not she was not ignorant to this, but she was also uncomfortable with it, too. But then she was like, well, this is how I get to this point also. Sure. And so where do scientists have to go in order to not compromise their values, but get the information, but also kind of be close to the algorithm. This is where I struggle, Leah, tremendously. So I'm curious sure. about what you think. You know? It's tough, you know, and like, I would be remiss and I would be an absolute liar if I told you that I hadn't posted thirst traps with a right. scientific caption. You right. know what I mean? Literally. <laughs> I'm like back before, you know, like I got softer in the cage and I had a six pack. I'm like, sure, I'll post a picture of me at the gym and then talk about like the mechanism of shuttling ATP. I don't care. It's getting the <laughs> message out. Um, and, you know, I obviously have sort of deviated away from that because I started garnering an audience of women younger than me who looked up to me. And I was like, I don't want them to think that this is how they need to deliver a message, even though it is effective and it does mm -hmm. trick the algorithm every once in a while. So it's, it is a fine line of, of kind of knowing your audience. Right. But then knowing, knowing what it is they want, right. It's like, you can, um, 
you say you're like a, a country star and you're like, all right, I'm going to go on a podcast about music. But if that musical podcast is about like Hungarian death metal, yeah. you're not going to get any fans from that podcast because no. it's so it's so mismatched. So if I garner views in a bikini, right, the people that are going there are only there to see the picture and they're not concerned about the scientific aspect. So at the same token, it's like, well, those aren't quality people that are yeah. following me because they don't care about the message. They're like, ah, we don't care. Like, let's see more. Bikini. Yeah, let's just see you know more I mean? skin. Come on, Leah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. So I think, um, yeah, I think there is a fine line and there's there's a weird part of the, al the algorithm. And I think trying to combat that is just being relatable, right? Not being stiff. Um, like I have profanity in my book, you know what yeah. I mean? I don't, I don't speak technically in my book. There's a lot of like sarcasm and like just gross sentences and, and things to just get people yeah. engaged in reading it. Right. So it's not a snooze fest, but you know, I'm, I didn't, in this book, I did not put bikini pics or anything like that. <laughs> so maybe well, I'm not doing right I by think the algorithm. People, people want to see themselves and other people. Sure. And I feel like if they doesn't feel relatable, then it's just kind of like, eh, I'll go to this person who's posting something hilarious and telling me this exactly. information. Exactly. You well, know, and sometimes, you know, I think that there's also this other side where social media and traditional media outlets, they overburden with a really pessimistic view of the world, right? You're yeah. seeing war, you're seeing what's going on in Iran right now, which is tragic. You know, you're seeing famine and flooding and all of these things. And sometimes you just want to not be lectured to. Sometimes you just want to zone out and just scroll through funny videos or videos of dogs or whatever, because yeah. you just emotionally are capped, you know, you can't take anymore. So I get that as well. And that's why when you're trying to, when you're trying to communicate a really important message to the public, you have to know going in that most of them are possibly not going to want to hear it, not because they differ in your views or they don't care about science, but because they're just tapped and they don't want to hear something super dense. You know what I mean? So yeah. the livelier, if anybody out there wants to be a public science communicator, the livelier you can keep it, the lighter you can keep it, the quicker you can make it, the better. Yeah. The better off. And I think like the look, you know, like the scientists of my past were like, the pocket protector, you yeah, know, the, the stuffy shoulder, <laughs> right? Like, it's just not a thing for me. And even when I was going through my education, I was like, I want to be the opposite of this. Like, yeah. I don't want to spend yeah. any time with anybody like that. Not that they're a bad person. It's just like, I, I don't like it. But I love when I see scientists and documentaries and they're wearing like Air Jordan sneakers and hoodies and stuff. I'm like, the sickest. That's what I'm talking about. Like that person, I could see them on the street and talk to them, you know? Well, there's also something to be said for encouraging people going into STEM fields that look like them, right? Uh, In my field, you know, only 30% of researchers worldwide are women. And so it's like, if you can't see it, you can't be it, you know, and like people of color, tiny minority, exactly. right? And so it's like, how can you aspire to be something if you never see yourself reflected in pe mm -hmm. people that you look up to, right? And so it's like, you see stuffy white dudes <laughs> right. the entire life. You're like, well, that's what a scientist is. And you don't necessarily relate to that, right? So yeah. I, I always say this to, to everybody. I'm a huge activist for minority groups in STEM fields. I'm like, if you are in a minority group or a marginalized group and you're in a STEM field, the best thing you can do is just be visible. Be visible, like be authentic, you know, when... Um, when I decided to get a full sleeve, obviously the, the thing that goes through your head is like, oh, am I going to be taken seriously academically? Mm, but then by yeah. the same token, I'm like, listen, the people that are not going to take me seriously, I don't really care what they have to say. No. Anyway, you know no. what I mean? Like allow my research and my merit as a scientist to stand true to how you should value me as a colleague, not because I have a tattoo, like, come on, you know, I know. and we don't, we don't want that kind of divisive attitude anyway. You know what I mean? Like science is for everybody. It is the grand equalizer. It should be all inclusive. So if you're going to be that way, then that's fine. We won't research together. <laughs> right. Fine. I mean, it's if you if you think like look back and like, again, I'm saying like people are generally really good. But like, you know, if you look back in the 50s, 60s, everybody's wearing like the same outfit. Oh, my gosh. And the same yeah. big trench coat and the hat. And listen, that was the time. If I was in the time, I'd probably be doing the same thing. But Yep. It was like this monoculture. Like when I see people with like purple hair, blue hair and stuff, they're into, I'm like, good. Or they're wearing something that they feel, you know, flexes for them. I like the creativity. And I think that's where scientists have to move to. Like, who cares, man? Let's like, are you putting good work out there? 
you know, is, yeah. is it solid yeah. work? Are you relatable to other humans? That's what's more important. Exactly. And I think that also will hopefully at some point contribute to a repairing of the distrust with the public. You know what I mean? Because no longer can you kind of scapegoat the nerdy scientist. You're like, oh, yeah. actually, that person is saying something valid and they look like me and they speak like me. And so you automatically kind of inherently behaviorally have maybe more of a connection to that message. Right. right. Um, because it's com a lot of it is confirmation bias. Right. That's why a lot of people never speak to people out of their like social or political views because they want to hear the things they already believe in. Right. Yes. They want to immerse themselves and and uphold the things they believe in. It's confirmation bias. It feels good to not be told you're wrong. So if you have more people that look like you that are telling you facts, you might be more willing to be like, yes, this person is in my group. They look like me. They speak like me. They've got sick Jordans like me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I trust them. You know, I trust what they have to say. I'm curious about what you think about this. So like, I believe like the CDC had basically cleaned house uh, a couple months ago and kind of admitted that this was not well done with COVID and circling back. And this relates to public health. Mm -hmm. What can institutions or people do to regain the trust or have better trust with public health in its current state? I think a lot of it, like the, the problem with the, the ball being dropped with COVID vaccine messaging was that Fauci kind of spoke in absolutes, right? right. Which is a big no-no in science, right? Because science is always evolving. And that's, that's the right. beauty of science. That's the nature of science. And so standing up in front of a nation that's scared and saying, this is kind of a silver bullet. This is what it will do. This is rather than saying what is scientifically accurate is we think at this time that this is sort of our best shot. This is a scientific thing that is currently playing out in front of the nation. So it's going to evolve as we get more information, we will pivot and adapt as all scientific theories do as you know, we, we do for every, every case epidemiologically, but he didn't say that he's, he tried. And I think he was trying to quell the fears of a scared population. And then the absolutes, when they turned out to be incorrect or they deviated, like I said, setting the expectation of the public, people were like, Oh my gosh, like they're lying to us. And then it turns into conspiracy theory. What are they covering up? And you're like, <laughs> they're not covering anything up. He just didn't really communicate accurately on the mic. You know what I mean? So I think if the CDC is going forward, what they should really do is harness the power of the current science communicators on social media. You know what I mean? Talk to them, see what they're doing. Why is it that the CDC can get up on a mic and be discredited for the science they talk about. Whereas I can get up on TikTok and talk about like NASA's dark program or whatever. And people are like, this is amazing. And they, <laughs> they love it. You know, they eat it up. And I think it's delivery, it's relatability. And it's also disclosing the fact, which I always do like, Hey, for quantum entanglement, we don't know what this particular thing is potentially going to do. We're still exploring. And that's the beauty of it. Right. And that's where you guys come in, help us explore get your kids to go to the sciences, whatever. Um, so I think the CDC has an opportunity to not be that like ivory tower, super stiff. The, we're speaking in absolutes, yeah. like just be relatable, just be honest, you know, like don't the public will know if you try to pull the wool over their eyes, just be honest. This was an evolving situation. This is the best information we have right now based on X, Y, and Z reasons. If it, if it evolves, we will pivot to that, but we're just trying to do this in the interest of public health. I mean, science is only as good as the time it's in at the current time. I mean, Absolutely. think about Galileo and, oh my gosh. you know, it's like we believe certain things about the earth and the sun that are very different than what we believe today. You know, yeah, Co Copernicus was like charged with heresy because he said, <laughs> hey, the sun doesn't actually revolve around the earth. And everybody was like, oh, unbelievable. How dare you? <laughs> right. <laughs> and now we look today. And I mean, even things that we believed science is so gaining such rapid expansion, right, that we're understanding things about phenomenon that we knew nothing about a couple of decades ago that we suddenly have like unpacked all of the mathematical equations for. Right. Um, so I, I think you just, I don't, I, I like, where does it start? There's so many branches that you can attack to make it more effective. Like, do you start in schools and do a better job of educating in schools and not just educating topics and drilling topics? Yeah. Teach children critical thinking skills. Right teach them the ability to unpack things or to question things or, or principles that will help them to evaluate statements. And so it's, I have a very, I have an idea that I've, well, I've been doing myself, but I feel like 
that there's this divide between, let's say, like the influencer who is masterful at getting information out, but maybe not super educated, and the scientist who is super educated. These people need to meet each other. Yes. And they need like the CDC needs to bring in people like, I don't know, I'm just don't like a physics girl or something like that, who has a huge yep. following yep. and say, maybe this person isn't as educated as us, but they're a hell of a lot better at getting the information out. We need yeah, to humble course. ourselves, both sides <laughs> yeah. and say, of course. you're doing this well. I'm not. We have this information. You don't. Let's work together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm hoping that as you know, the generation of those that hold office kind of move on that sort of kind of antiquated, maybe even potentially like baby boomer generation where everything was like staunchly like conservative and scientists can't have a sense of humor or a personality <laughs> is giving way to a younger generation of people who are brilliantly smart can, you know, talk the talk and communicate it effectively. And, uh, and, and I think that that can potentially change the game, but right now it's tough because uh you know the the people with the, the the big podiums in life right like the national podiums they're they're the ones that are sort of boxed in right by what they've been taught which is like just stay in your little lane and don't yes. laugh and don't make jokes and <laughs> yeah we want to be serious we want to be taken serious here this okay? is science this is serious and i'm like <laughs> if you've ever been in a lab you know it is not serious <laughs> science is silly no and fun, disgusting. okay <laughs> yeah oh my god it's and it's a shame because i think that is the whole, you know, if you go to like, we just had Halloween, right? If you go to like a spirit store, mm -hmm. you can go find a scientist costume. And what does that costume look like? The biggest dorky square bear, like front pleated dockers, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's not cool. And I, I hope some, at some point we can change the game to be like, oh, scientist is just literally anybody with a white coat. Well, I think that's what's happening. Like people like yourself, I've talked to so many scientists and they're, I can see the change in the look and the sound. And I, I'm yeah. encouraged by that. And really, I think it's just time, you know, it's as generations change, how, like I said, how, what people were wearing back in the fifties and sixties to now exactly. it's changed. It's just, people don't like to wait for the change. They hate exactly. it. They and want it and now. You know, I think what something that I've also been doing a, apart from science communication is just communicating objective news because something that I always tell people, um, like I, I had a video go viral on TikTok because I just reported objective news, right? I It was the weirdest thing. And people were like, oh my God, like I haven't heard of any of these things <laughs> transpiring, right? It was like when, when Masa Amini thing started and I was like, you haven't heard of any of this, that's unbelievable. But I realized that there is a massive disconnect between the way in which objective information is delivered in the traditional facet. It's not keeping up with contemporary consumption patterns, yes. right? Like CNN and Dateline and all these to do massive segments where they'd be like, we're going to talk an hour about the OJ Simpson car chase. Right. And it was like this long, immersive, long didactic yeah. and long narrative. And people don't have that attention span. Right. Like we ingest data and really quantized packets. And so I've found that that the reason that people don't know about these massive geopolitical events is because they're not consuming it in the way that traditional news is offering it. So that's another thing is just. Yeah being adaptable to the ingestion process of the public, right? Like as some of them have made, tried to make the quantum leap where like CNN has a TikTok or what have you. I still haven't seen anything like evocative on there that like helps <laughs> get it out. But there's a, there's a TikTok page called under the desk news. And it's just this, this lady and she sits on, underneath her desk and she's like on the floor and she amazing. communicates yeah, news in like 60 seconds. And, and she's got a massive following and it's because she has tapped into contemporary consumption. Um, yeah. So there's so much of that as well. Like what's the behavior of the public that's changed from, like you said, the fifties to now yeah. completely different, completely different. That's why I think podcasting is important. It's completely become a valid source of information. It has allowed people to see behind the curtain of people. Yes, so of all course. of a sudden, like you remember, like if you would know about somebody in the, you know, in the past, you didn't really know anything about them just their kind of public facade, but through the podcast, you can actually hear them talk about their thoughts and ideas and what yeah. they like and don't like. And I think people eat that stuff alive. You know who I think the first person to really capitalize on that was, was Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. You know, he is an astrophysicist, right? We're talking yep. about like studying myopic, myopic stuff, like not even an astronomer, an astrophysicist. That's really obscure stuff. But yes. he was the first person to really champion 
you know what? I do astrophysics, but you want to talk about biology? Let's talk about the biology of the human cell. You want to talk about the, you know, and he broke it down very simply and was very relatable and was kind of cool. He was like the cool dad, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like laughed and had fun and and went on podcasts and uh, like this and just kind of was open and honest and answered things and and became a figure that the public immediately recognizes. I would I would say that apart from like Stephen Hawking um, is probably the most recognizable scientific figure of our time. But everybody knows who he is. Everybody you know I mean? knows. And I, yeah. And I think that he was such a beautiful moment of that transition between the old traditional way of doing science and then the new way of communicating it. He got it. Like he was like an early adopter of like, this is what I'm going to do. And I think that's why he's been so successful at what he does. So what's your path? I mean, where do you see this going for you with, you know, being on podcasts and communicating science? You know, it has evolved originally when I started. I I never said like, I want to be a science communicator. I was just a scientist that started answering questions for friends and, you know, maybe recklessly exploding things on camera for kind of entertainment for the people I knew. And as I continued to do it, I just garnered a, a, a following of its own. You know, people would find me and be like, this is awesome. I show my kids these videos or what have you. And um, in doing what I've done, it's really opened my eyes for the last five years or so to the massive amount of scientific illiteracy that exists in adults. And unfortunately, that colors the way that they vote, that colors the priorities that they set for things like climate change. You know what I mean? When you don't understand the crux of what's happening, it's difficult to relate to like, oh, so the earth is heating up by a degree. That's not that bad. You know what I mean? <laughs> so so I, I, I really where I see this going is just continuing to sort of fight the good fight and to hopefully inspire my colleagues to do the same, to not only inspire adults, but to empower them with science. I no longer want science to become a thing that is divisive or is unfortunately at this point, a thing of privilege, right? Uh, because so many people that can't afford to go to secondary education, they, they will never understand these principles, right? It's difficult. Um, and I, and I don't, that doesn't sit well with me. You know, I didn't grow up with privilege. I worked my ass off to go to the places that I went and to study the way that I did. And I've paid for everything and I'm in this avalanche of debt now. Um, but I, in, in seeing it and going through it, I'm like, man, this sh science is for everybody. You know, we shouldn't gatekeep the very fundamentals of the world around people, right? They should be able to relate to the world around them just as we do. Um, so hopefully I'm hoping to inspire an education or, uh, inspire people to go into science in the generation after me and to empower people with knowledge so that they they feel more comfortable sifting through nonsense and being able to identify <laughs> possible BS versus what's valid. Um, because I think there's a lot of fear in the unknown, you know what I mean? And then it doesn't sit well with me. I think that it is our job to be stewards of truth as scientists. So, I mean, I think we got to end on that. That was just the perfect <laughs> way to end the whole deal with that. But yeah, I so appreciate this wonderful conversation. Seriously. Oh, it was delightful. It was absolutely delightful. See, I knew I was looking forward to this for a reason. I knew. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and please tell everyone how they could connect with you. Oh, sure. Uh, you guys can find me. I'm at gnarly by nature randomly. <laughs> Love that, by the way. My social Love media plus. So random. Uh, nature spelled with a G N because it's silent because I thought I was clever at the time. Um, or you can just Google me at Leah Elson and you will find me everywhere on the Internet. I am pervasive on the interwebs. So that's probably <laughs> the easiest way <laughs> or at LeahElson.com. Fantastic. Leah Elson, everyone. Thank you, Leah, for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.